Hey, everybody, this is Gene Hoagland, and you are listening to Agoraphobic News. Hey, Gene, how are you? I'm doing excellent. Can you hear me? I can, yeah, I'm doing great. Are you in uh, San Francisco or... I am in San Diego, and that's where I live, and that's the southern tip of California. San Francisco is about halfway up the state, so it's about 500 yeah. miles away. So I'm at the very south, right, right on the border. So uh, do you have any news regarding the upcoming Dark Angel album? Because, you know, we've been all waiting for that to happen. I understand, and I appreciate everybody's patience, absolutely. You know, I'm just trying to write a right like crazy and when i get my spots to write and jim durkin and i have have you know we got about five or six songs on the go and that's kind of the best way that we work and i've mentioned this before that's kind of been part of the the uh not not stall or anything but just the part of the part of the patient process is trying to get the time to get up to la and Jim and I work best when we're just sitting across from each other with a couple of guitars and going for it. We've tried the the Skype, you know, here here's some riffs and you got some riffs and and we've tried the, you know, videotape the riffs and send them over and and the songs and stuff and Jim's always doing that for me and I'm getting to learn stuff that way but uh yeah, it's 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 slowly coming. We're hoping to get a release, you know, by by if not the end of this year by 2020, you know. So that's yeah, it's still coming. Great. I'm, just, I'm just trying to make it like a super energized, super fun, ball crushing record, you know, that's just going to just destroy all. That's what that's what I want. <laughs> so I hope it happens. And uh, uh, can you describe how is it going to sound like? Well, I mean, one thing when compared with a lot of people are asking, like, when... hey, is it going to be like Darkness Descends Part Two or Time Does Not Heal <laughs> Part Two? And it's like, well, gosh, I, I, I can't say that it's going to sound like either, but we are definitely taking the the energy, you know, like that youthful, like, because I feel like I did when I was 17 when I joined the band. I feel like that now, and I got that kind of excitement going. So definitely the energy and having Jim involved, that's going to be a whole lot of darkness to send. <laughs> riffing which is badass and having me involved that means that's going to have some time does he does not heal esque moments but we're just going to try to make it sound like dark angel like just a kick-ass wow yeah this is dark angel i recognize i recognize the approach i recognize the the the, the power that that i'm hearing and this sounds like dark angel so that's what we're trying to do and, and hopefully that will come across and basically you guys will be touring for that we, we hope for right. that too trying to get some stuff on the go for that as well so that's going to be super cool and and i hope we get to make it over you know to europe and stuff and we have our windows of scheduling that that we we have to kind of stick to because gosh i'm so busy and everybody yeah. is busy you know everybody in the band they got their own things going on so lining up the schedules has always been you know part of the process part of the challenging process but we'll We'll get everything on board when it needs to be, and, and hopefully we'll be on the road sooner than later. Yeah, awesome. And uh, when did you hear Dark Angel for the first time since you haven't been the original founding member yeah, of the that band? Was, I, I saw them and got a demo in like late 82. Like I actually saw them before. Awesome. They before I saw them, before I saw Slayer even, and I saw Slayer, it's been 37 years now, 30, what is it? I saw Slayer on February 14th, 1983, for the first time God. at their thrash unit, when they, when they turned all leather and thrash metal, because I had seen Slayer before that, and they were doing covers, and they, they looked like... Uh, kind of like the scorpions kind of they kind of have, there's the photos from those days back in the super yeah. early covers they're wearing the the leopard skin and the the bandanas around the wrists and stuff 
and I had, I had caught Slayer then at, at the Woodstock, and a few months later, it was just a complete 180 change of awesomeness when it came to Slayer. And I was seeing Dark Angel and, and you know, Metallica I'd seen a couple times by then and all that. So those were the first three kind of thrash bands that were poking around the L.A. area at the time. And the Exodus, I think. And that was up in the Bay Area. And we weren't real familiar with Exodus yet. Um, we got more, I got more familiar with Exodus in 83 and now that, that was pretty badass and, and definitely like 84. And then, you know, remember the, uh, the Bonded by Blood album was recorded and released on the tape reading scene in 84 and it was out for like yeah, yeah. nine months before it came out. So, you know, we all had <laughs> the, uh, of that. We had the, we had the Ride the Lightning demo that was kicking around, you know, nobody had that, but we got a copy of that. And then that had the four tracks that I think have since been released on one of their re-releases of, of Ride the Lightning. And that, that, that Ride the Lightning demo was, was killer. You know, it was a live off the floor demo. And, and if anybody gets a chance to look that up on iTunes or get the re-release of, of Ride the Lightning, I mean, that was, that was some kick-ass you know direction there on that on that demo so there you go yeah and uh, who was uh, what band which band was like the most extreme in these early days in the bay area in well, your in opinion the bay area, well i'm i'm from la and remember that's 400 miles south so we yeah. had the la scene going and the all the intense bands were it, you know and and i guess let's just start from 83 um when that's when it started getting kind of solidified that okay now we've got some real extreme acts here in la and slayer dark angel there was abattoir which was juan sure. garcia later of agent steel and now in body count you know he had abattoir going and they were kind of a you know more more of a kind of a power metal but traditional european metal they were heavy they were cool and you had bands like uh, vermin in la and and um Power Trip, I remember them. They are the band, the band called Power Trip, not the current Power Trip that has got some new releases mm -hmm. out, but there was a band from L.A., and they, to me, they coined the term speed metal because I would see on their flyers the, quote, L.A. hardcore speed metal rules. And I'm like, wow, Power Trip. Okay, I'll go check these guys <laughs> out. And they weren't quite, they weren't very vicious, but, you know, hey, they, to me, they coined the term speed metal. So, um yeah, you had a lot of killer acts, and and definitely by '84 up in the Bay Area, you had, you know, you had Exodus, you had Possessed, you had, you know, I mean, Possessed was killer back in, back in the early, super early days. They had that four-track demo that they put out, the death metal demo, and that was killer. So everybody had had their moments. Excuse me, I'm gonna wander through here <laughs> a second. Okay. Ah, we got a we we had a we had a leak going on in our place last night. So now we got to have a plumber come out and then a oh a guy, shit, man. Yeah, it's it it's it's been raining like crazy here in 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 San Diego, and we're not used to this kind of rain. So our it just there's just kind of flooding happening in in spots all around. So having to deal with that as soon as I get off the phone here, I gotta become domestic and deal with a plumber. So. <laughs> Super Mario kind of thing. <laughs> Absolutely, that'd be great if Super Mario and Luigi came walk through the door and yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, and uh, how did you get into? I mean, uh, when you got into into the band, uh, what was like the the atmosphere? Did you get pumped? I mean, excited excited from the start that you were playing with Dark Angel or? A absolutely, because um, you know, I got to tell you that. Um, like when when I was on tour with with Slayer and when I was 16 I was doing lights for them and this was before I was in Dark Angel and um I I used to do Dave's uh drum drum uh drum checks you know like his sound checks um I wasn't Dave's yeah. drum tech I was their light guy but I would jump on stage and play with the band so Dave could be out in the front of house to check out how his drums sound and you know we'd play Slayer tunes 
I played a lot of Dark Angel songs with Slayer because they were playing a bunch of just goofing around in soundcheck. They were playing a lot of Dark Angel stuff. And I remember having the conversation with Hanneman. You know, there was this conversation that we had and he was just extolling the virtues of Dark Angel. And I was like, man, Jeff, I've, I've seen Dark Angel. Yeah, and they're good. I like them, you know, but man, you're in Slayer. What are you worried about? Dark? Because he was like going on and on and on about how kick ass the new yeah. Dark Angel material was. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I believe you, you know, but you're in effing Slayer, man. You got Show No Mercy out. You just recorded the Haunting the Chapel EP. And this is the heaviest music I've ever heard in my life. And you're concerned about Dark Angel, like how they're, they're heavier than Slayer and faster. And, and I, I, I just dismissed what, what Jeff was saying, you know, it's like Dark Angel were my friends and I'd seen them and all that. And then I heard the new songs that Hanneman was talking about. And that's when I was like, holy moly. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, you're right. Um, they are the new dark angel is killing. And those two songs were a song called the burning of Sodom and, awesome. per and perish in flames. Those were the first two songs that were written for, for darkness descends. And when I heard those songs, that's when I went to Jim, Jim Durkin, apparently. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I don't remember this, but I, I told Jim, Hey man, I'm better than your drummer. I want to play for your band. I need to be in your band. <laughs> and I, I don't remember any of that. That sounds like some cocky thing I would say back when I was a teenager. It does. But, yeah. uh, but when I joined Dark Angel, I know Jim got excited because I brought like some heavy, you know, I just wanted to be in the heaviest, most brutal thing that we could ever become. And, you know, Dark Angel and Jim was right there with me. You know, we we really liked and we, we really liked all the heavy stuff that we were hearing, you know, and and I love Jim's new songs, you know, Perish in Flames, Burning of Sodom. Those things were just ball crushingly heavy in yeah, 1984. Yeah. So, um, so having, having that happen was, it was super exciting. And having, I know Jim got excited because now there were two like minded guys in the band, him and myself. Dark Angel was a little bit scattered in their direction. You know, you got other guys, right, you know, throwing in songs that weren't quite the most brutal. And the singer kind of wanted to have this direction. And, you know, I know Eric Meyer, the, uh, you know, the, the other guitarist, he kind of had his vision of how he thought the direction should go. And Rob Yon, the bassist at the time, you know, he, he kind of felt the band should sound, we should sound like this. You had... Four guys at, at the time before he joined the band, he had five guys in the band, each wanting to go in different directions. <laughs> and so when I joined the band, you had at least two guys wanting that same direction. Let's just be heavy, brutal, you know, speed is not important, but the heaviness and the originality. Yeah, let's let's go for that. So so that that was kind of the when I joined, that was kind of the initial starting point for everything like let's just make the heaviest stuff we can come up with and and you guys did <laughs> oh very cool thank you you know we just <laughs> like we tried to come up with beats that hadn't been heard before and things like that and and i was so excited i was 17 and i just i i was a ball of energy i was like yeah let's let's go i got lots of beats you know i could play drums yeah. okay i'm pretty decent at 17 so let's let's take this as far as we can go with the with the heaviness so so there you go awesome man i mean i'm speechless when i'm hearing all these stories because oh that's fun that, that's like the the best thing that happened to metal 1986 probably for trash metal you know with yeah, all okay. these with all these albums like you know master of puppets peace cells Dark, darkness descends and many many others so. yeah you got you got it uh you know pleasure to kill yeah and you know a lot of... cruelty by sodom yeah that's right yeah that was, that was a killer everybody was putting out really good stuff then you know just lots of energy there were there were still no rules yet so it's if you were fast and heavy it didn't matter what your vocalist was like like gosh look at 
Look at Nuclear Assault. You know, I mean, game over. That was a great record. And, and yeah. I love John Connolly, their vocalist, because he didn't he didn't sound like anybody else. And he had a really cool approach with his vocals. And, you know, underground bands like Wargasm that were putting out demos and things like that at that time. And they, they were killer. You know, they had a great approach. Wargasm, not sure, not, not sure if you're familiar with those guys, but they're... Their first album was called Why Play Around, and it had a lot of songs from their demos that they had, the Satan Stole My Lunch Money demos. Those were killer. You know, it's 86, super exciting time. You know, a lot of the upcoming releases for bands, like the Death Angel release and the Testament release, those were getting out on the on the underground tape trading scene around that, you know, the late 86 era. And it's like, wow, you got a lot of cool stuff coming out in 87 as well. I really enjoyed 87 as a year for metal as well, because artillery put out terror squad. That's one of the most classic thrash albums of all time. And, and you had, you know, you had the new Testament and, you know, Anthrax had put out Among the Living and, and even death, you know, death had screen blood. blood And that was, you know, 86, 87, those were a couple of really killer years for, for Thrash, totally. I mean, f- from 1983 to 1991, that's like the 1993, let's say, in this 10-year period, you have so much things going on. I agree. And and the- even, uh, absolutely, even in the 90s, you know, you like in 91, I remember um, Cyclone Temple released I Hate, Therefore I Am. That is another absolute, absolute classic of thrash metal. That's one of my all-time favorites, them, Artillery. Those are two of my all-time favorite thrash albums. And so tasty, so killer. The riffs are amazing. The vocals are great. Drumming is killer, all, you know, all over the place. So super exciting time, totally. Yeah. And uh, is it true that Ed Repka designed the logo for Dark Angel? Well, he designed the wings. And uh, he also, yeah, he worked on the coloring for it. We had the, the essential, I guess, the, the Dark Angel font, um, mm-hmm. which I swear to God was when I was a kid and I see the Dark Angel logo, I was like, that looks just like the Def Leppard logo. <laughs> Before I was in the band, you know, and even when I was after I was in the band, I was like, kind of a Def Leppard logo, if you ask me. <laughs> but um Ed designed the, the the wings, both both wings, the ones from um, Darkness Descends, and he designed the coloring of that logo. And I tell you, I never, to this day, I never understood the on Darkness Descends that that purple grape dip in the logo. It's like half the logo is like all bright and sunny and shiny, and then it's a <laughs> purple grape juice at the bottom. I'm not sure why that happened but hey there's there's the logo on our album that's printed okay but (laughs) so that's when i was like ah we gotta fix something on the next record so by the next album leave scars we had the brand new logo and we went from having the purple grape dip in the logo to our our logo had armpit hair (laughs) if you notice the bat wings you know yeah bat wings got little armpit hair i was like oh that's fun (laughs) so there you go yeah, and uh, what is like the song "Perish in Flames" all about? I mean, well, I don't I know. I did not write any of that, but that song I think is essentially about uh, you know airplanes dropping bombs during wartime. I think that's yeah. essentially you know flying jet fighter pilots and dropping bombs on your enemies. So I think that's pretty much <laughs> sums up that tune. World War Three or something like that, probably. And, uh, and, you know, one of the, yeah, just one of the scenarios of war is dropping the bombs from the, from the planes, you know, <laughs> I think. Yeah. And uh, how intense was this, uh, this uh, kill a poser thing back in the, you know, California in the 80s? Well, it, it was, it was prevalent. Definitely. I don't think any posers got killed, but I know a whole <laughs> lot of posers got bloodied. You yeah. know, it, it was like down in L.A., we we definitely we, we had the connection with the Bay Area and the Bay Area and Exodus. That was real. Like having <laughs> having 
Bailoff, you know, I, I, I've been at parties with Bailoff uh, and, you know, tying up the guy that shows up that had the, the, the poofy hairdo, like a Motley Crue hairdo that just happened to come with his girlfriend. And all of a sudden he gets jumped on, he gets tied up, he gets, you know, his hair cut off or he gets, you know. So I'm not going to say whatever else happened to some of these guys, but I was like, yeah, these guys are violent, you know, and, and yeah. that was pretty fun. So, I mean, our, our, our crew, like the Dark Angel crew that was on the Darkness Descends record, our, our, our road crew, those guys were, they really took to the whole killing posers thing, you know, beating them up. They would, if they did not like your band, they would go up and pull you off the stage and beat them. Off the stage to because if they didn't like you, and these guys weren't necessarily big, scary looking guys, they were just tough dudes that would like if they don't like your band, they'll go beat you up for being in your band. It's like, <laughs> okay, but there were no rules, it was like the wild west, it was like you know, not a lot of law and order, and you could get away with a lot more stuff back then, but. Nowadays, we would never even consider any yeah, of that. Yeah. You know, we're we're pretty, you know, we're mature, peace loving older guys. So yeah, and back in the day, it was fun, but I wouldn't suggest for anybody to go out and kill any posers now. <laughs> we can make fun of them, you know. But yeah, of course. I don't know if you remembered. Uh, there was like a comic book called uh, Poser Wars, and that uh, comic was like uh, drawn by the girl girlfriend of Paul Bailoff. Oh, that's it, hilarious! Yeah, and it, it has like two issues. Issues, I think, and oh, it's that's great. like it's like uh, I think the, the band Exodus killing posers in the Bay Area, and it, it's really great. You can find it on the internet. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, I gotta check that out. That sounds really <laughs> awesome. That, bring back some fun memories. Yeah, because those guys were into it. You know, like gosh, I remember <laughs> um, when when we did that Slayer tour. Um, Slayer played Ruthie's, and it was Exodus, Slayer, yeah. Possessed, and Vermin. And I believe that show was on June 23rd, 1984. And I think that might have been Possessed's second show. They were amazing. Slayer came out and killed it. The guys from Metallica showed up. And I remember James. James was in the front row for Slayer. You know, he was banging his head like crazy. Cliff was there and awesome. Exodus came out and they had a couple of the security guys on stage because their crowd just immediately went nuts. And one thing I thought was <laughs> awesome is that instead of chanting Exodus, Exodus at the front of the show, at the start of the show, the crowd was chanting kill, 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 kill. Awesome. I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> This is awesome. Yes. Yeah. And Exodus, their their security guys on stage had cattle prods that they would have to cattle prod the people back into the audience. I don't know if you know what a cattle prod is, but you know it's a stick that has like a, you know, electrical, you know, electricity on it. Uh -huh. so they're cattle prodding yeah, people, so and there's guys, you know, <laughs> guys like Toby Rage that are walking on top of people's heads in the audience and. It was so over the top nuts. San Francisco was so psychotic <laughs> in terms of the energy and the metal and just the the, <clears throat> the flat out like just manliness of everything. Like LA yeah. was definitely they you know they were we had the bands we had cool bands but at, but uh, the Bay Area just had the entire approach. You know they had the bands they had the the. <laughs> the fans that were psychotic guys like air andy airborne anderson toby rage they had a, a group of fans up there called the screaming veggies that were just psychotic thrashers you know they'd show up and just the pits would just get crazy and these guys were the leaders of all of it and you know when, when you're a 17 year old kid these guys all become legends to you you know like yeah, it, was, it was super cool man i was i was having a great time We'd head up to the Bay Area a lot, you know, just jump in my truck and drive up there and catch shows at Ruthie's and then go sleep in a supermarket parking lot, you know, like just in the back of my truck and then drive home the next day sort of thing. We'd, we'd do that a ton back in 85, 86, 87, totally. Awesome. 
So the hippie kingdom was kind of violent in the eighties. <laughs> it, it it had its faction of violence, indeed, man. There was there they they left the the peace, love, and and all that. They left that at the door, and you know there weren't a lot of the peace, love, and hippies at these shows. There were just a lot of <laughs> aggro long hairs and a lot of punks too. And yeah, it was it was a good scene, man. Totally. Yeah, and where was this aggression coming from? Was it drugs or just to? a way to have a good time or something like that well now i i i heartily believe that um the bay area scene that was definitely fueled by a whole lot of drugs totally um <laughs> you know a lot of the powders as well as as the the the, the pot and stuff like that. that that i guess you'd come down you know with the with the pot but um <laughs> yeah I, I i was not into drugs at that i was i was pretty i was a straight edge during all that but i i saw it all go down and it was like yeah i can see where you know if if, if you do a few lines of meth this is the kind of music you are gonna write you know so i had my <laughs> yeah, own versions i guess i would eat caffeine pills which is like drinking a couple of cup, cup, cups of coffee but yeah i wasn't about <laughs> to try any of the hard drugs but you know caffeine pills ginseng i remember drinking a lot of ginseng back in the day because it would give you energy and i just i wanted my energy not to be i uh you know just drug induced but caffeine of course a drug but that was a safe drug you know it was that you yeah know, caffeine, you innocent know, little drug <laughs> precisely you know and yeah. I, I didn't feel like a drug taker or anything <laughs> like that it's like oh it's like i drank a couple of cups of coffee so there you go yeah, but I, I really think that the people were, were violent, violent because of the cocaine and speed and because in the 80s you had cocaine everywhere in yeah, the America, you know. What is even more brutal is the Bay Area scene wasn't very involved in cocaine. They were more involved with crystal meth, which if you know <laughs> anything about the two drugs, yeah, crystal yeah. meth is a lot more brutal. You know, that will scramble yeah. your brains way harder than cocaine will. So, and that's what, they, so that's, I, what all the, that's what all the thrash metal scene was into. You know, hey, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. Certain members of Dark Angel, they, they like their, <laughs> they like their crystal, you know. So, but that was way back then. And I don't think anybody does that anymore. You boy, you die. These yeah, but I, I, I think you can you can't play thrash metal with, with LSD, you know, you need something to <laughs> To let well, out your aggression. God, I remember, um, like, Steve DiGiorgio was in Sadus uh -huh. at the time. And, you know, they were just so aggressive. They played, we, we, we had Sadus open for Dark Angel so many times up in the Bay Area. And Steve was telling me about the times, like, and, and Sadus was as aggressive as they came, as fast and furious mm. as, as, as anybody. And, but Sadus, they were just some pot smokers, you know, and they were, they were like, the, there was this band blind illusion. You might be, be familiar yeah, with yeah, them. And I know them. back when, yeah. back when Les Claypool, Les Claypool and, yeah. and Larry Lalonde were playing with, with blind, blind illusion. They, they do a lot of shows with Sadis and the blind illusion guys, they would, they would trip on their, on their mushrooms or their acid or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, go out and play, and then, and then, you know, here's Sadus just smoking pot, yet we're so aggressive, and I just, Steve was telling me that the Blind Illusion guys used to trip on us, like, how could you guys smoke that much pot, and then come out and, like, <laughs> roar the way you guys do, and they're just like, oh, we don't know, this is what we do, it's like, yeah, everybody but, else is on the other kind yeah. of drugs up here, you guys are just smoking pot. Yeah, that, that explains where Les Claypool was coming from, basically. Yeah. I mean, yeah, try some mushrooms, <laughs> try a little acid, a little, little whatever, you know, boy, a bunch of drugs I never tried, but, but there you go. Killer. And uh, for how long w was, like, the Bay Area or California scene that crazy? It, was it uh, during the whole 80s or this aggression kind of, kind of died, died out? Yeah, some, I do some... believe it was, it was a good, hearty period of time, like, we we started knowing about the bay area scene you know reading all the fanzines and all that reading about all the bands like 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 anvil chorus and leviathan and laws rocket and uh vicious rumors and all that and then you know some of the heavier bands that were coming along and of course 
that's why Metallica escaped LA to go to the Bay Area <laughs> because they just had they it reading all the fanzines it just looked like they had maybe um a little more unified scene like maybe they had some well we we had the clubs to play down here but there just was not there just really was not a scene for the heavier stuff you had a few bands in LA bands like Savage Grace they're another one you know kind of on the thrashy power metal side Savage Grace Slayer Bitch Abattoir playing a lot of shows together down here but you know the the crowd was it was it wasn't large this music was just too heavy um you know in in 83 that's when the motley crews and quiet riots and bands like autograph were all getting songs on the radio and rat was getting on the radio and that that's what all the la bands all the wimpy bands they just <laughs> a, a lot of those la bands like band, like take a band like rat for instance they they were heavy you know they were heavy metal they were a heavy metal band they weren't a radio pop band they were a heavy metal band they had riffs that sounded like uh like like say symptom of the universe from black sabbath you know they had songs that had heavy riffs like that in it bands like great white before they were great white they were called dante fox they were heavy they had like a motorhead approach or or accept fast as a shark kind of thing um you know kind of you know double bass speed metal kind of approach they weren't writing songs for the radio at the time and then after motley Crue and quiet riot especially you know just broke gigantically on the radio that's when all these bands just changed their sound and it was like okay you guys now you're posers now <laughs> i'm sorry you suck you know you had decent <laughs> material before stick with it you have a good heavy metal career no you dropped all the heavy metal you put on the makeup and the the bandanas and the hair spray and all that stuff and you wrote a bunch of wimpy songs so now you guys are posers i hate all of you you all suck now and that's when all the heavy stuff started happening however it was um there was the scene quote unquote scene in la was about 30 dedicated hardcore metal metal heads that would show up to all the shows all the same folks would show up to the same shows and it was underground i loved that it was too heavy for all the posers you know i loved that i was the only person in my high school that looked the way that i did and listen to the kind of music I did. I I I looked like your average metal head, you know, the denim jacket, yeah. patches, stickers. I mean, uh, patches and buttons and and spikes and all that. That that was me. Nobody looked like that in my high school. You know, you had one other <laughs> rocker kid that tried to dress like David Lee Roth or something, but I was an absolute outcast, and I I didn't care. I didn't fuck. I didn't care at all. You know, like. Fuck high school. Fuck my high school. Um, I did well in high school, and that was really hilarious because everybody thought I was just this freakazoid metalhead. But I'm in all the advanced placement <laughs> classes, and I'm I'm getting good awesome. grades. But everybody just thought I was like I. They thought I was the drug dealer. You know, just the way I looked. Yeah. I didn't even do drugs, but nobody ever cared to get to know you. <laughs> just you're judged by all the. All the popular kids, and I, I judged them right back. I hated every one of them. So, um, <laughs> but the scene in LA, man, it, it, you know, that's why we'd go up to the Bay Area, you know, because you'd like get all these like really killer shows at Ruthie's, at, at the Mabuhay Gardens, at Rock on Broadway, at the Stone, you know, a lot of really cool shows happening up there. And it just seemed like it was a, a little more unified. They'd have like if LA had. 30 people that would show up at the shows um the bay area would have 200 you know of, of yeah. people that were into it so i could see why metallica you know when wasp is the heaviest thing in your town <laughs> yeah you got to get the hell out you of need there, to go right? you yeah <laughs> exactly yeah, so, so basically L la was a poser city that and san that francisco had a good faction of heavy bands within it but yeah. the posers they were the cockroaches and we were just 
you know, little <laughs> ants of bands. You know, we just yeah. there weren't many bands, but they were good. You know, and just the Bay Area seemed to have it together a little more. So that's when you started seeing Slayer, you know, heading up to the Bay Area to play. Metallica already moved up there. You know, Dave Mustaine from L.A., he went up to, to you know, the opening Megadeth shows were all in the Bay Area, you know. The the first and, ones. Uh, of those, yeah, it was just, that was a great place to play, man. You, you, you'd be accepted right out the gate. If you came, if you brought it <laughs> heavy, the Bay Area was India, and that was cool, you know. Awesome. And uh, do you remember these uh, Slay Team guys? This kind of gang. Um, well yes and i think like for me that was just a an exodus t-shirt you know because i uh -huh. like we knew the screaming veggies which that <laughs> was the faction like you heard of the screaming veggies the slate <laughs> team we just thought okay that's a really kick-ass exodus shirt you know i'm 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 not really familiar with the Slay team up there, but the Screaming Veggies are all the psychos. Like I said, the Toby <laughs> Rage and Andy Airborne Anderson, who went on to sing for uh, Attitude Adjustment. You know, Andy Airborne, if yeah. you're familiar with them, Chris Contos was in Attitude Adjustment, and Andy Airborne Anderson, their 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 singer, he was you know he was called Airborne for a reason. You know, he's a massive stage diver. And, <laughs> Their crew of guys were, you know, you, you'd hear about them. But, yeah, the Slay team, I, I, it, perhaps there was one. There was something maybe I didn't know about, which is, you know, yeah. we had no internet back then. But uh, it, it sure made a kick-ass uh, Exodus shirt back in 85, totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, you guys in, I think, 1987 released the Leaves Cars, though, or 89? 89, that was 89 right? yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is like the lyrical concept of uh, that? What, what is there any concept or not? Oh, absolutely, to... yeah, big time, boy! I was tackling all sorts of stuff, like the opening track, for instance, a song called "The Death of Innocence." That was, that was a song about uh, child molestation and pedophilia and things like that. And hey, "The Death of Innocence" that's that's a song about you know pedophilia, child molestation. Um, that is written from the standpoint of the child molester and you know that's one thing that i noticed back you know writing writing lyrics for thrash is that a lot of people in in metal or in music they would kind of stand outside if there were if there was a concept that was controversial or one that you wanted to make a statement against I noticed they would kind of stand outside the concept, point their fingers at it and say, that is wrong over there, like nuclear war, yeah. that is wrong, you know, or whatever the popular yeah. concepts were. They would point at it and say, that's bad, that's not good, that's wrong, got to fix that. And I just thought, well, maybe what if I just, I got inside the concept and wrote from that standpoint. And I make it pretty apparent inside the song that the child molester is is you know, very wrong for what he's doing. He's a mental aberration. He's he's sick in the head and he knows this, but he cannot control himself. That sort of thing. We got a lot of flack for that song. People kind of misunderstood and they're like, these guys are promoting you know, No, obviously <laughs> we are not. Read the lyrics, yeah. you know, it's right there in the lyrics. And a song like The Promise of Agony is is that's just kind of like an open suicide letter, you know, like just suicide notes, like somebody that's just about to take their own life. Here's an example of that. And, uh, you know, some of the other like Leave Scars, for instance, that song is is, you know, it's just uh, a statement of being an individual. You know, uh, leaving scars is means, you know, leave an impact, create an impact no matter where you go and live your life the way you want to live it. And you're going to be OK. That's what I do. And I'm going to be OK. I was a child writing these lyrics, essentially. And I knew I'm going to be OK <laughs> if I keep living my life the way I want to live it. You're going to have a good life, Gene, and you're going to be very, you know, you're going to remain true to your beliefs and you're going to be OK in this life. That's what that song's about, Leave Scars. And so, yeah, there you go. There's There were a lot of concepts about it. I was more interested in the concept than the actual lyrics. Like, if you noticed on Darkness Descends, 
I had a lot of concepts on those, but the lyrics, like I was a young man with a vocabulary, you know, it's like, I, <laughs> I knew yeah. a lot of big words and I would throw them in there. And, you know, it, it just because I, I, I wanted Dark Angel's lyrics to stand out. I, I mean, I, I, I was a, you know, I was like mm, an English major, quote unquote. You know, like that was my interest in in high school. You know, creative writing. I, I wasn't. I never considered myself much of a lyricist. But uh, when I joined the band, the band had said, "Hey, we hear you write lyrics, so you want to write our lyrics for us?" And I was like, "Okay, well, let me give this a shot." So. <laughs> Um, I, that's kind of the lyrics I wrote. Lots of big words. A lot of people have told me, man, I had to break out a thesaurus. <laughs> I had to break out a dictionary to figure out what the hell you were talking about. And I, I actually got more intelligent by reading your lyrics, you know, cause I'd have to look these words up. So it's like, okay, well, I guess we're helping people get a little smarter. Maybe that's cool. But, but yeah. There you go. A little bit enlightened. enlightened yeah, absolutely. And you know what's funny? Like uh, "Darkness Descends" is uh, really apocalyptic in terms of lyrics, while the "Leaves Scars" and "Time Does Not Heal" are more like of uh, social oriented. Absolutely, with social they're a little more personal, indeed. Yeah, 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 man, totally. Well, like for instance, on 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 "Darkness Descends," we had a song called "Death Is Certain, Life Is Not," and that yeah. was the first song where i i tried to get a little personal with it it's a it's a conversation between uh, uh somebody who wants to help the person who is either paralyzed or needs to be euthanized and it's the person having a, a discourse with somebody else who you know this person wants to die the person in the song is trying to help and you know, that was, that was kind of, that was influenced by something that happened within my family. You know, I lost a family member and, and, you know, I watched it, Too bad. you know, kind of hurt my, 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 my mom, you know, it was my mom's brother and, you know, hurt our family. And, you know, I just tried to kind of view, take a, take a standpoint of, you know, euthanasia. Is it a good thing? You know, if you have to pull the plug on a family member, that's, yeah. You know, that's heavy. That's a heavy thing, you know, so I just tried to to come at come come at it from a personal standpoint and not just be like, oh, you know, oh, nuclear war. That's really bad, you know, or, <laughs> or you know, yeah. I, yeah, we had our songs about jumping in the pit and, you know, killing people, crushing people in the pit. Merciless death. I didn't write that one. But, uh, you know, I tried to make a lot of songs just kind of personal. And in that regard, bands like Trouble and excel from la um they 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 had quite an impact on my on my lyrics um you know i just tried to write something from the heart um and try to open yourself up a little bit rather than just writing about yeah you know i'm i'm driving in my car or or you yeah, know yeah, gonna course. jump in the pit and kick some ass in the pit or you know hey nuclear war that's bad i just tried to make something a little more personal and I realize maybe a lot of people might not be able to relate directly to things, but when people would relate to it, you know, it, it writing a song about pedophilia, not a lot of people are going to necessarily be able to relate to it. But when you meet somebody that was like, your lyrics had a big impact on me because I've gone through that. And like on time does not heal. We had an ancient inherited shame, which was written about rape from the, females standpoint and um you know i've had Can you I've, hear? I've had people come in you know tell me that that's you know that song for instance had a big impact on me you know I've, I've i've gone through what happened in that song so so there you go you know you impact a smaller amount of people but perhaps that impact is is greater. bigger yeah, songs, maybe yeah so how did uh, Ron Reinhardt uh, come into picture with the band? Well, we, um, you know, we had, 1987 was just a, uh, a very challenging year for the band, trying to keep our vocalist, uh, I guess, engaged 
in the band or uh, you know our vocalist at the time was just he was having a lot of outside interests that weren't well ultimately not good for him or definitely not good for the band and so 87 was just a challenging year like for instance we had our tour with possessed going on the gates of darkness tour and like 10 days before the tour a week before the tour he came to us and said i can't make this tour i have a court date you know involved in some stuff you shouldn't have been involved in and i've got a court date i can't it's right in the middle of this i can't leave on tour you know it's like what are we what are we gonna do we had to find a vocalist you know i had to sing some shows for dark angel you know play drums and sing because he just wouldn't show up you know we'd be out playing in texas and he's like yeah i'm gonna fly into the show i'll be there in time you know here it's showtime he's still not here so i'm the one having to sing and so i I couldn't wait to get rid of him, but he's not mine to get rid of. He was in the band before I joined. So I, you know, I just like this guy's, he's, he, you, you, we realize he's anything but professional here, guys, right? And so he just made it really impossible to work with. So I had seen Ron play in a band, um, a band called Messias, which is like things spelled Messiah with an S on the end, Messias. And um, yeah, and I was like, "Fuck, that guy got a great voice, looks cool." Like Ron was the first guy in thrash metal that was like fully sleeved, you know. I mean, he, Ron had some, you know, he had some jail time, I guess, and <laughs> and you know, he was a tough dude, and he 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 was all sleeved up and tatted up, and nobody looked like that. He was big guy, tough guy, great voice, cool attitude, and and. We had, um, I had seen him play about a year or so before, and after we had gotten rid of the other vocalist, we had we went on quite a search for you know because thrash metal was not it wasn't real big at the time. It's not like you had people beating down your door to say, "Let me join your band," you yeah. know. And, and vocalist, you know, you gotta, yeah. gotta have a good vocalist. You can't, you know, we we auditioned so many guys, and there were a bunch of guys that were like. Hmm, this guy might be the guy, but, yeah, but you know, gosh, I sure wish somebody else would come along that really blows us away. Um, and then Ron's name came up. You know, he reached out to somebody, maybe Mike Gonzalez, our bass, reached out to somebody saying, hey, man, I hear you guys. Maybe I can come down and check it out. And that's when I was like, ding, holy moly, I saw that guy play. That guy's awesome. I, I, I know who you're talking about. I've seen this dude. And he came down, <laughs> his first rehearsal – I've said this many times. I, you know, came down to check it out, hear a few songs from us, and 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 just hang out for for a, a jam. And the first song that we did was the "Immigrant Song" by by Zeppelin. We just, you know, like, hey man, maybe yeah, something we, we all know. And that's why we ended up putting it on "Leave Scars" because I mean, he came out and just killed it on the first first shot. And we're like, damn, awesome. Okay, well let's let's move forward. So it was really exciting getting Ron. He had a great attitude and and. You know, Ron and I had butted some heads back in those days, but uh, you know, I had my vision and he had his. But we all we all got together. We all got it got it together. And Ron was great. And you know, poor guy, he had to learn a whole lot of lyrics immediately. You know, <laughs> I remember telling him, "Hey man, yeah, we're not yeah. playing. We're not going to be playing any shows, but we do need to get working on this record. And we've got it mostly written. Got a whole lot of the lyrics here." And I remember telling him, we're not going to be doing any shows, so we're just going to concentrate on learning these new songs. And then, boom, all of a sudden, a month after he's in the band, we got like three shows booked, one in L.A., one in Bay Area, a couple in the Bay Area. And he's like, I I thought we were just learning new songs. You know, now I got to go play the show with us? Okay, well, and he jumped in there, and he was killer. It was great. So so that was really cool. And he worked out great. And Ron's Ron's awesome. I love Ron. He's, he's amazing, you know, and he's, he's, his voice now is even better than it was back then. Cause he's got like this rich, heavy, low voice going for himself that I'm like, fuck, I can't wait to get you on recording with our new stuff. You know, it's going to be killer. So I'm really excited. Yeah. I can't wait to hear it, man. 
Absolutely. mean, we've been all waiting for so long. And I appreciate everybody's patience, man. It has been a challenging <laughs> few years. But, uh, I, you know, thank you to everybody who's listening that has just been sticking it out there. I appreciate it. And hopefully, you know, everybody will be really pleased. You know, there won't be any – I know this isn't going to be any half-assed record. It's going to be full, you know, jumping in with both feet on – terms of heaviness brutality and speed and aggression and energy so hopefully everybody's just going to be like god damn way to go dark angel hell yeah so there you go <laughs> yeah man and did you guys have problems with pmrc maybe because of the lyrics or slight but you know we were relatively underground i got some complaints we got some people picketing and that sort of thing and and got some official notices uh for for songs like the death of innocence and things like that and uh um but we were generally off their radar we had a few christian groups that reached out like how dare you we've got the copy of your <laughs> album and <laughs> you're all sat you're satanic and all this stuff's like where is there any references to satan in our music other than satan does not exist kind of <laughs> approach like i don't know how you're calling a satan why because our name is dark angel like obviously you are not uh investigating deep enough if you're just calling us a satanic band for no reason that's that you know that wasn't our approach at all so so there you go. But the ones that would read the lyrics and then reach out and complain about it, it's like, okay, well, you know, obviously you're not reading them deep enough if you're complaining about it. I'm I'm saying this is bad, you know. I'm, yeah, of course. I'm explaining in the songs that this concept is not good and you're misunderstanding and that's I guess that's what people would do, you know. They just get it in their head that this is the way it is and there you go. So yeah, but I don't even understand why did this PMRC thing happen. I mean, uh, it's like basically a censorship in, in art. Absolutely, and absolutely. That's... and that's how it was taken. And, you know, with the, with the hearings that they had where Frank Zappa spoke, Dee Snyder had a very cogent argument against a lot of it. Destroyed um, them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that just kind of showed that, you know, but but boy, just just to to move forward a couple of years, that PMRC stuff was probably the greatest thing that could have ever happened to some of the more controversial acts like Guar or Marilyn Manson or Rob Zombie <laughs> or any of that. You know, you get a PMRC sticker on your on your album and kids just flock Love to buying. It. <laughs> they, that was the greatest thing. Like, hey, buy me. <laughs> is what the PMRC logo should have read, you know? Buy this! <laughs> so, there you go. Awesome, awesome. And I really think that, like, Tipper Gore was the most hated wom woman in the 80s, probably. Could have could have been, you know, absolutely. You know, that, like... And it was just any sort of judgment. I'm, I'm just so against judgment. You know, don't judge me. I don't judge you. If you want to do yeah. your thing, you do it over there. I, I have no opinion on what you do in your life or for your entertainment. You know, as long as it's not injuring anybody or anything, I'm all for you doing what you do. Let me do what I do. And yeah. when you've got a judgmental regime in, 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 you know, that are making policy and things like that, they're, you know, naturally the, the, the subversive elements of society, like us long-haired heavy metalers, we're going to be the first ones that get the serious judgment and the negation, attempted negation of what we believe in. And yeah. I don't believe in that at all. You know, I'm all for free speech, free, you know, you do your thing, I do my thing. Hey, we're, we're good. Um, but there you go. It, 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 it ended up helping you know yeah, of course for some bands totally absolutely and uh like three or four days ago uh time does not heal turned 28 i mean holy that's... crap really yeah yeah <laughs> and that's fucking i mean i i can't believe that that, that record is so old but it's still relevant you know oh well thank well, you that's cool 
so uh, what was like the the idea behind this whole album music wise what did you guys try to to do with it well it was we were just happy to be able to move forward because um on the leave scars tour we lost our guitarist jim durkin you know he had to he had to exit the band in <clears throat> and um so we as you know in, in an emergency effort we flew our friend uh brett erickson from the band viking you know we got in touch with brett and said hey can you come out maybe learn the material and and jump on stage with us and start playing and he was like yeah sure i got the time available let's go and so brett came out and after the tour finished you know we asked hey would you be interested in sticking around and during this tour that he came and helped us out on viking ended up just disintegrating underneath him so he returned home to having no band and so he's like hey man i'm let's gene let's let me come join and i was like beautiful <laughs> you know i'd already heard some of the riffs he was throwing down like I remember he brought the song Act of Contrition in its entirety, no, just instrumental version. Um, he brought that, he had a little, you know, cassette tape of like, hey, here's my latest tune that I'm working on. As soon as I heard that, I'm like, yeah, I want, I want your riffs for Dark Angel. I want you in the band. I love Brett. He was awesome. He was a cool guy. And it's like, this is going to be great. So as soon as the tour was over, Brett and, and you know, it established, okay, let's, let's do this that summer of 1989 through the next summer of 1990 brett and i just got together all the time and just worked on on time does not heal and he brought some great riffs and it was you know i tried to bring some decent riffs i always like everybody else's riffs in the band more than mine um but <laughs> i've got a lot of them so um so brett brought it big time and his his um contributions were fantastic and wonderful and and i was really stoked and we were just like i said we were just happy to be able to carry forward and since the leave scars album was such an atrocity of an of of, of a production we realized it was a terrible sounding record at, at, to this day i guess that's my one dream about revisiting the past is i would love to get the masters and remix leave scars at some point. Um, I don't know if that'll ever happen, but uh, that that's my one dream. Just have, because <laughs> leave scars had some great riffs on it. They were yeah, just buried by a muddy production. You know, every song sounded completely different than the last one. And so that's why we decided, you know, like, Hey, let's get a guy. Let's get you know, <laughs> the number one producer for our kind of stuff right now is Terry date. Let's get him. And, yeah, he's um, awesome. Yeah, and he was, you know, he he came in and coordinated the sounds and and you know just just got us got the album. You know, we we obviously knew the album was going to sound decent, and so that was like, whoo, thank God, you know, little little pressure off there. We knew it was going to sound good, so we could just concentrate on just you know performances and getting the best performances we could. Um, so yeah, there you go, and and I. I the lyrics were, were, were decent, you know, and, and all that sort of stuff. So we were really excited with Time Does Not Heal. And, um, you know, uh, not, not, that, not that this matters at all, but I remember the reviews for it were, were incredible. You know, we were getting 5Ks in Kerrangs. We were getting 10 out of 10s. People were referring to it as this is the greatest album since, since uh, And Justice For All. Awesome. Um, and, you know, that's, I'm, I'm like, wow, cool. But it didn't mean a darn thing because the kind of the thrash metal uh, bandwagon was just on the, on the last, last legs in 91, you know, by 92, yeah. it was full death metal for everybody. So, you know, people <laughs> ask, people have asked me over the years, hey, did grunge kill like thrash metal? I'm like, fuck no, death metal killed thrash metal. You know, <laughs> grunge? to me was very thrash oriented i know for a fact kurt cobain was a thrash meddler you know and you know really? when i'm hearing the when i'm hearing bleach you know for the first time i'm like this guy is into thrash and sure enough 
when I joined uh, Strapping Young Lad a few years later, Byron Stroud, their bassist, um, he was really good friends with Kirk. And he was telling, he, he fully told me that Kirk was the one that turned me onto Dark Angel. You know, he was playing <laughs> Darkness Descends for, for me. You know, he turned me onto it. I was like, I knew it. I knew that guy was a thrash metal. I could, I could tell in their riffs. This is thrash metal. But I can't, I can't I believe know. that's like, I, I never heard of that before, you know. Okay, I, <laughs> I fully think it, you know. And, and I remember meeting Kim from Soundgarden on the Leave Scars tour. And, you know, he came out to see Dark Angel. And he was like, dude, dad, you know, we, we dig it. You know, he, he, Kim was really into the fact we were doing fear covers, you know, from the band fear. We, we had yeah. a couple fear covers in our, in our set. And he was like, dude, who covers fear? That's awesome. You know, that sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, uh, thrash metal. Absolutely. And, you know, even, uh, you know, that, that new metal stuff that came around in 1995, 96, 97, all that new metal thing. All those songs, all that new metal stuff, those were all the breakdown beats from thrash metal songs. Yeah, the the, the mosh parts, all that new metal was, was just, oh, you guys just, your entire approach is the mosh part from thrash metal. That's, that's the way I felt. With down-tuned guitars, basically. With down-tuned guitars, but, you know, every, every thrash metal song had the breakdown in the middle, and that's all that new metal was. Just, you guys just took all the breakdowns, and... That's the way I felt about it, you know, and, um, you know, I thought Biohazard sounded a whole lot riff-wise like uh, Celtic Frost. <laughs> you know, I thought Celtic Frost created the, that simple, like, they weren't down-tuned, but that very simple could-be-one-fingered riff. That, that's the Celtic yeah. Frost approach, you know, they sound, absolutely. So I, I, I'm a, such a huge proponent of thrash metal. I think thrash metal influenced everything that came yeah I, I really agree with that because if it wasn't for venom and uh, thrash metal yeah, you wouldn't absolutely. have any extreme genres so absolutely absolutely and, and i really hate uh, the way people treat the thrash metal as some something like uh, i don't know something uh, less intelligent or even music wise it's uh, they they behave like, you know, the thrash metal bands are retarded or something like that. But oh if my it was... God, I, I, those guys are posers then. Those are the guys <laughs> I pick the shit out of. Because you're, if, yeah, if yeah. anybody thinks that, I'm sorry, you're, you're flat out stupid. Thrash metal yeah. was the most intelligent. There was nothing lyrically before thrash metal. There was Van Halen, party, 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 Motley Crue, party girls party drinking riding <laughs> yeah or you know maybe some deep purple let's get in our car and drive really fast highway start you know you had songs about cars girls partying and and fighting the good fight whatever the fuck that was <laughs> you know like thrash metal came along and put concepts down and put you know had some social commentary had personal viewpoints you know like that would i'm sorry if anybody has any problem with thrash metal man send them my way because i'll set everybody <laughs> thrash metal flat out best style of music ever ever yeah. best style of metal we love judas priest we love iron maiden we love all that stuff obviously but thrash metal then it got super exciting you know the yeah. speed the heaviness the like the f you attitude the fuck you attitude that was that was all thrash metal, you know, like, and the intelligence, you know, Metallica had intelligent concepts, you know, like, you know, nuclear assault, you know, uh, God, Excel, you know, Dark Angel, uh, even Slayer, they had amazing lyrics, you know, Angel of Death, that's the yeah, ultimate lyrical awesome. heavy metal song ever, you know? Yeah, and even Exodus, it had, you with the... Uh... Steve Souza had some great lyrics. Sure, man, absolutely. Even with Bailoff, hell yeah, man. You know that was that was incredible. <laughs> and uh, for how long you've been playing guitar? Because you know, uh, some people may not know that you wrote some riffs for Dark Angel. Absolutely. Well, I've been playing guitar now since um, I guess I started playing guitar in 1983. That's when I got my first, you know, like little acoustic 
or whatever. And I remember in, in, you know, 1979, 1980, I was playing the viola and which is a larger violin. I was, I, I started by playing that and I'd bring my viola home from school and I would just take a, a quarter and start plucking that like a guitar. So I kind of taught myself how to play guitar on a viola using a quarter and then oh, you know a, a friend of mine just loaned me their beater acoustic and so i just i just went to town on that and i i went for a good 10 15 years of always having a guitar in my hand you know so um i i'd, I'd take the pepsi challenge with my playing chops up against any rhythm guitarist you know <laughs> back, back in those days i got to admit my chops are a little little shoddy at the moment but um uh, compared to how I was back then, because I don't play guitar as much as I did. But back in those days, if I was at home, I, the guitar's in my hand for six hours, easy. You know, just teaching oh. myself how to play. And I, you know, I, I learned how to play guitar to playing, you know, Exodus riffs and Slayer riffs and Dark Angel riffs, early stuff. You know, even Death Angel. You know, I could figure their stuff out real easy. You know, and and. You know, I was just figuring out all these thrash metal stuff, and that just kind of helped me out of how to play guitar, you know, totally. Great. And uh, how did you get involved with Testament? Um, let me see. In 1996, I got a call from, from, from Chuck Billy saying, hey, Eric and I are, we're, we're putting Testament to rest. Um, We'd like to start a new band. We want to call it Dog Faced Gods. Would you be interested in, you know, coming up and tossing some jams around and seeing how it, how, how it goes? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's try it. And we started writing material immediately um, for what became Testament's demonic album. Uh, Eric already had a bunch of ideas. And so we just got to writing just instantly, you know, and... Um, Again, this was under the going to be under the banner of Dog Faced Gods, and we rehearsed for about nine months, putting songs together or so, uh, about six or seven months, and halfway, you know, toward towards the end of that seven month period, I remember Chuck coming to me and saying, "Hey, you know what? Our um, our record labels that we're dealing with, they are requesting that we carry on with the name Testament." I was like, okay, well, there you go. At that time, I had also recorded uh, Strapping Young Lads City record, and I was so effing excited about that. That was like, holy Jesus, that was that was my new jam. I was like, okay, guys, I can help you guys out totally. Testament, I'm I'm here for your record, and this was kind of right before the time when you really could do two bands you know, no problem. You could be in this band over here and that band over there, no problem. But at that time, I thought, I got to choose, you know? Yeah. So when Testament said, hey, you know, we've got the album recorded, it's getting released, would you like to, you know, we'd like to make you a band member? And I was like, hey guys, I'm I'm, I'm with Strapping, you know? Um, so Testament and myself parted ways. Uh, you know, amicably and all that sort of stuff. It's like, hey man, yeah, I'm just I'm 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 going with strapping. And then a bunch of years later, I guess it was probably around late 2011 or so oh, in, in 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 mid 2011, I got a call from Chuck saying, Hey, we've got an album that we need to get to recording. And Paul Bostaff, who was in the band, he's got an injury that he's it's 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 taking him some time to heal from and we got some deadlines approaching can you just come up and record this record with us and i was like absolutely yeah i've got some time available so let's make that happen and so we tracked the dark roots of root of earth record in 2011 and later that year testament was out on the road with uh anthrax and death angel and they had john tempesta playing drums for that tour john also was in the cult so um and and still is and john had some cult business to deal with in the middle of this tour so chuck called me up and said hey man we got johnny t playing for us but he's got to split the tour for a couple of weeks can uh can we ask you to come in and just fill in for a couple of weeks and which that happened and and that was cool and at the end of all that i was like hey man if you ever need this again just let me know and sure enough the next tour came up and 
Chuck reached out again saying, hey, we, we, we can't have Johnny for that tour. Can you come help us out? And I've just kind of been hanging out with him ever since. Awesome, man. And what is it like to play with Testament live? Because, you know, that's such a great thrash metal band. Oh, that's cool. It's super easy. You know, it's enjoyable. I enjoy the shows. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's fun music. It's cool music. It's, um, I love, I got to admit, I flat out would love to play every aggressive song Testament's <laughs> ever written. I'm down for that. I love that. If anybody decided like, hey, we are only going to play our most brutal songs, songs like, awesome. like Fall of Cypledome, Legion of the Dead, uh, you know, Number Game, Formation of Damnation, some of the earlier, heavier classics. I'm all down for that. If somebody said, let's just play the most brutal stuff we ever had, that would be amazing. I think that would be yeah. awesome. But I don't know if that's ever going to happen, you know. Um, but I love Testament's aggressive stuff. I love aggressive thrash metal. You want to give me a 90-minute set of aggressive, double bass-filled, brutal thrash metal? I am 100% down for that. Um, awesome. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. And uh, do you have any news about the upcoming Testament album or something like yeah, that? Yeah, Eric and I are in the process of writing it. We've got about six songs together. I... I, I I scoot up to Sacramento um, every every week, essentially, um, every couple of weeks. And Eric and I take three or four days and we lay down a bunch of ideas. And, and we've got about five to six serious, um, you know, formations of songs, big fat skeletons and a couple of those nothing is quite finalized yet because you know it will we'll be tweaking these until the album gets recorded i'm sure you know um we could get in the studio and and tweak a bunch of songs so nothing is truly done until the album's out but you know got like six or seven ideas five or six ideas right around there alex skolnick he's bringing some killer ideas to the table too so it's going to be a killer kick-ass testament record everybody's going to enjoy it it's going to be just a you know, Testament has a good grasp on what Testament does. So it's going to be just another kick-ass Testament record. Totally. Yeah, I can't wait to hear that, man. Absolutely. And uh, what was like the most demanding ba band to play live? I mean, because you played in so many bands over the years. Yeah, sure. Um, well, gosh, I strapping was very demanding because there was a whole lot of double bass a whole lot of blast beats and i love that you know like <laughs> i say give me give me the most aerobic <laughs> music i could play live and i'm all about it that's why when i would do double duty for like testament and anthrax you know playing the same show and i'm playing drums for both bands i love that you know give me two and a half hours of high speed hauling music a night i'm all about that you know so that's why i love playing with death you know like the death to all yeah. stuff that we do i love that because it's uh it you know i love the high energy i love playing a lot of double bass and i'm all down for it um i crab about it i joke all the time like man i hate <laughs> playing double bass but if it's something i've already <laughs> recorded and i'm playing it live bring it on i'm down for it so strapping was challenging death clock was very challenging in terms of you know everything that we did was also to a click and the click track ran the the cartoons that were playing behind us you know on the big screen you know i don't know if you've oh, ever seen death clock live footage or anything but this enormous screen behind us it was all on my shoulders i like that whole show was it's not like we individually started each song it's like we started the show at the top of the show and everything just went off an hour long click track essentially and i had to be so spot on every single night because you got to get the lip flap correct yeah. you can't go off one half beat because then all the tracks that we would play to we'd have some keyboard tracks nothing nothing guitar oriented or anything some vocal backing tracks sort of thing the big choir -y vocals, you know, those were on tracks. Um, you know, those all got to match up. And so 
it was that was a challenge in terms of the responsibility of okay there's 5000 people out every single show we were selling out everywhere and and all the responsibility is on my shoulders so that was that was fine but that was a fun challenge and and musically that's a challenge because there's a whole lot of blast beats and hauling double bass and that stuff too so so that was all really cool man strapping death clock um the 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 project that i have started with with my wife my wife lara she our project that's my absolutely my most challenging music that i'm playing at the moment um way more challenging than dark angel way more challenging than testament way more challenging than everything else that i'm doing uh because she's relentless on me and my and my feet she's like dude <laughs> you play double bass i'm not going to take it easy on you like those other guys do get some double bass in there. <laughs> i love i love that she pushes me like crazy and and that's the most intense, brutal music that I'm playing right now, and the most next level. I can't wait for that project, but that's got its yeah, that's got its time, you know. In the and uh, what what's that project uh, name? We don't I mean, have a name yet. We're just writing uh, material like crazy. So, so that's really awesome. I'm I'm stoked to get that done. But we've got that one just kind of on the back burner because I got all this Testament, all this Dark Angel. Yeah, we yeah. have Death Wall stuff happening th this year, hopefully as well. So. It's busy times all over the place. And uh, what's what's like the music direction of that project? Is it uh, next like... level metal? Absolutely oh. <laughs> next level. Heaviest riffs you can imagine, catchiest riffs you can imagine, most brutal new drum beats, never been heard before kind of stuff. So is um, she playing uh, guitar or she's on the vocal? Yeah, she's 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 doing both actually. She plays guitar. <laughs> she, I, I I like. I, I know she's my wife, so I have to exclude that from this statement, <laughs> but it's still, it has nothing to do with the fact she's my wife. It has to do with the fact she is also the most amazing riff writer I've worked with in 20 years, you know, in, in probably in all time. She writes the most insane kick-ass riffs, and you've heard about people that just shit riffs, like, <laughs> I, I'm a non-stop riff well um i'm 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 a an avalanche of riffs that that's her you know totally so awesome. it's it, it's killer so i'm stoked and uh, do you have something exclusive uh, that you didn't mention for this interview i mean <clears throat> well um in terms of exclusivity i'm i'm i never keep like secrets from people but one thing that i have been um really leaning towards of late is um i'm really preparing my my career and my health and my my i guess longevity for an extremely long extremely long brutal career um like i've mentioned it recently that i intend to be playing brutal thrash metal blue brutal drumming <laughs> hauling double bass deep into my 70s like <laughs> no problem so i'm starting to kind of prepare for that now <laughs> um, um you know i've been i've been dropping a lot of weight i've been in the gym i've been working out i've been also augmenting you know like trying to take my 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 uh nutritional intake i've been trying to do that a lot more intelligently and one of the things that i've been involved in i've always been well for the last 10 years or so and i freely admit my wife lara got me into all of this health stuff that i'm in she's my guru of health um <laughs> uh, I've, i've been doing uh, a concept called superfoods for years don't know if you're familiar with it but it's just essentially concentrated vitamins in <laughs> dirt tasting form <laughs> like, the, it, like the average superfood just looks like a bunch of you know just ground up greens like it kind of looks like 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 pot shake you know like <laughs> the stuff at the bottom of your pot bag and it tastes like dirt um all those superfoods that i've been doing i've discovered a new superfood and i'm working you know with this company called high on life superfoods and uh 
they they have a superfood called lit that i swear to god is the candy of superfoods it tastes unlike any other superfood it doesn't <laughs> taste like dirt and granted there's a lot of people that I, i'm turning everybody onto this you know a lot of people come to me like hey what's up with this lit stuff like i was I was speaking with the the guitarist of Suicide Silence last night. He's all into lit. I don't know if you're familiar <laughs> with Suicide Silence, but you know one of the yeah, younger, yeah. newer, kick-ass bands out there. He's all about this. I had no idea. He comes up to me talking about lit, and I'm like, "Cool, awesome." I had no <laughs> idea, and he's super into this actual stuff that I'm doing. And and I'm telling uh, you know Derek from Scour. You know that's Phil Phil Anselmo's new band. He was like listening to our conversation. He's like. I, what are you guys talking about? I want this. And so that's, you know, highonlifesuperfoods.com. If people are into checking out some healthy stuff, I know it's not rock and roll, you know, to be <laughs> healthy, you know, but it's like my wife says, it's a lot fucking tougher to be healthy. It's a lot more hardcore to do. This stuff tastes like a lot of this health stuff it's a lot more hardcore than just shooting back a shot of vodka. That's easy. You know, yeah. taking, taking apple cider vinegar. Oh God, that stuff tastes horrible, but it's good for you. It's a lot more hardcore to be healthy than, than it is to be a, a unhealthy, just degenerate, you know? So <laughs> in terms of, of prolonging my career and bringing it, you know, it's it's one thing to play some drums in your 70s. Yeah, lots of guys do that. You know, Deep Purple, they're in their 70s probably, and he plays drums, but that ain't the kind of drums I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, like, I'm going to be wielding this stuff. I was having a conversation last night with Paul Paul Mazurkowitz from, from Cannibal Corpse. Cannibal, yeah. He's in the, you know, I went to go see Cannibal and Morbid Angel last night. Great show. Boy, that's, it's a, it, it, the tour just started here in the States. Killing show. <clears throat> Morbid was great. Cannibal was amazing. Um, talking with Paul, he's in the exact same concept that I am. You know, he's like, he looks great. He's, and he was telling me the same thing. He's like, dude, I've been watching what you've been saying about your health. And that's real inspir inspiring to me. I want the exact same thing. I want to be doing this in my seventies. I'm like, let's, let's be the leaders of this then Paul, this is awesome. You know? So yeah, uh, that, that all really incredible. And you know, I, I don't care how, how it sounds, but this is what I have to do in order to be able to be dominating at 70. Like I said, it's one thing to play some drums in your seventies. Okay. That's cute. No dominate. I'm going to be dominating. I, I don't care who else from my era who might be dominating. Maybe people are starting to set themselves up to be dominating, but I know that I am you know, and that's what I care about. I, I care about, you know, being in my seventies and destroying people, you know, that's the <laughs> way I, I'm 51 now. I'm a baby. Like I remember God, back when I was a kid, 51, that's grandparent age, you know, like you're yeah. in your fifties, you're ancient. And obviously it's not like that anymore. A lot of things are better for us. 50 year olds, you know, 50 is the new 30. I get that. I've heard that. I get it. That's the way I feel. I feel like I'm 27 now. And I've said this before that in my, in my seventies, I'm going to be a lot, I'm going to have a lot less weight on me in my seventies. Um, I figure I'm going to be like this cut ripped up 70 year old. I think, you know, I'm 51. I, I weigh what I weigh now. I'm a lot slimmer than I was in my, in, geez, in my twenties, in my thirties. So right now I feel like I'm 27. So I figure when I'm in my seventies, I'll weigh probably 30, 40 pounds less than I do now. I'll have ripped up six pack abs and just muscular as fuck. I'll probably feel like I'm 22. I, yeah. I, that's the way I figure. And I get everything I want. That's my whole life. Everything I've ever wanted, everything I've ever aspired to, I get. So I'm putting this intention out there and that means it's already done. You know, like I'm, I'm that kind of uh, person, I suppose I can, you know, I get what I want. I get, you know, I, I, this is the way I wanted to look when I was 50 this is how I look in, in my seventies. That's how I envision myself looking. So I figured 
it's going to happen. You know, like yeah. anything I put my mind to, I do. So there we go. And this is like the larger than life challenge, basically. Because Big uh, time. You know, that's like the life goal absolutely absolutely yeah it's it's it is uh, yeah, god uh, like i said when you know 20 years ago 30 years ago when i was when i was a younger i'm like 50s uh, you you're you're a grandparent you're done <laughs> like i was i was talking with paul from you know paul last night paul from cannibal and we were we were talking about remember when we were kids like you're 16 17 18 you're in the rehearsal studio and you see those guys in in the room down the hall and they're in their like mid 20s late 20s like say they're 29 years old when you're 17 you're like looking at those guys like god you're ancient dude you guys are over you know at 29 you know that's that's the concept when you're 17 18 29 is like that's just ancient you know, and now here we are 51, like I feel like a baby. So, so I'm, I'm stoked on that. I'm super excited. And what basically keep, motivates you for all of this? What keeps you going? Um, metal, <laughs> metal and, 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 and my, and my, uh, impact upon metal and music and the impact that I want to leave and the, responsibility that I have to myself to never rest on a laurel, you know, never just sit back and go, okay, hey, I've had a good career. I'm ready to just kind of cruise yeah. it on out. No, I'm going to be a progenitor all my life. Like when I'm in my seventies, I'm going to be creating beats. Nobody's heard then, you know, <laughs> like that's my intent. Um, you know, leaving leaving a scar on the music industry and being an example of, holy fuck, what a champion! This man is in his seventies and he's killing it. That's my <laughs> that's for that's for the future and for the current. It's like I just this is my inspiration. You know, just I this is all I do. This is all I've ever done. I've only ever been a musician. I've never done anything else. My last day job was in the 80s i've only ever had one job my entire life outside <laughs> of of being a thrash metal drummer you know so it's it's my responsibility to myself and my own uh gosh i guess honor system to just keep bringing it like for instance this next testament record might be the next album that i actually track i'm gonna bring it on that you know, it's going to be some kick-ass drumming, and it's just going to be like, yeah, there's Hoagland being a being oh. a killer. You know, that's that's what that's the legacy I want to leave behind of just nothing but awesome ever came out of Gene Hoagland. That's the way I view it. <laughs> if you look at my catalog, you know, I've recorded like 50 records, and none of them are a dud. Um, there might be some musics that maybe you're not into, but I haven't put out one dud record where I'm like, oh God, that was embarrassing. I'm so sorry I was a part of that. I've never, you know, like even even some of the bands that I might not have been super into that I've tracked for, those are still kick-ass records. So, yeah. so there you go. And uh, what is like the an album that you're the most proud of from your career? Uh, let me see. I love the City album and the Alien album from Strapping Young Lad. I love all the Death Clock stuff and the Galacticon stuff. And there is an album from one of my more underground bands, but you can find this album on Spotify, on iTunes, and that's from my band Mechanism. And the album was called Inspired Horrific. That was a great record. Didn't get a lot of uh, attention whatsoever. Um, but you know, if people are listening, want to check out my, it's the, the most insane drum album I've ever done. Um, you know, mechanism, check those guys out. There's also oh. another one of my bands called the almighty punch drunk. And you probably can't find their stuff on, on Spotify or, or, or iTunes, but you could probably find it on YouTube. That was the almighty punch drunk. The album was called music for them asses, uh, them asses not 
them asses. So that's fun, you know, fun title. That was kick ass. That was that was some kick ass thrash metal when nobody else was doing that kind of music. So that was really cool. Devin produced it, and that was cool. So, um, yeah, I I I I enjoy a lot of you know a lot of my stuff, and I will freely admit that if I need some drumming inspiration, and this might sound really odd, and my wife loves to tease me about this, is I'll go back and listen to my stuff as opposed to like maybe busting out an old like rush record or something. I, yeah. I will, if I'm doing a hauling double bass record, I'll listen to my stuff and go, okay, I did that once I can do it again. You know? So I'll, I, <laughs> I listen to myself as inspiration. And I know that's kind of, I, I know that sounds egotistical, but it's actually a, a proving point for myself. Hey, you did it here. You can do it again. The kind and of you thing, can outdo my yourself basically. yes and that's what i'm all about i'm a, i'm about outdoing myself i don't care about anybody else i don't care about outdoing some other drummer there's a lot more talented drummers than me you know ab absolutely guys that destroy me but i'm into outdoing myself absolutely and i love it when if i'm involved in a project that allows me to outdo myself that's why I'm saying the project with my wife is the most outdoing myself project I have going. Granted, we don't have anything out, so I can't necessarily prove it to people. But as soon as people hear this, you'll be they'll be like, holy fuck, Hoagland. Like, <laughs> you are not kidding. Um, I'll freely admit, you know, uh, you know, Dark Angel, I'm going to bring it on the Dark Angel record. But that's going to be, you know, like... I'm not going to vary too far away from Dark Angel's approach. I'm not going to be like writing all this, you know, I'm going to write beats that haven't been heard. Yes, but I'm not going to make them overtly musical. Uh, if that makes any sense, I'm not going to try to write some pretty stuff. Dark Angel's going to be heavy and brutal and, and psychotic. Um, Testament, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work with what I'm given there and try to make it as intense as I can. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, that's like I say, my stuff with my wife is the most challenging stuff that 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 will be the stuff where where people will be going like, holy moly, Hoagland. Nice work. Totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, do you have uh, any last words for this interview? Uh, well, thank you. I, I definitely thank you, Milos. And I thank anybody who stuck this entire interview out. If you listen to this entire thing, <laughs> you are a champion. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't bored anybody, but, uh, you know, I appreciate everybody who is a heavy metal fan. And if you're a Gene fan or a fan of any of my projects, I thank you very much. I appreciate everybody's support and I hope to see everybody on the road. I know, you know, Testament's going to be on the road. Dark Angel's going to be on the road. Hopefully Death to All's on the road. So, you know, we're going to be out there. I'll, I'll be doing my thing in front of live audiences real soon as again. And, you know, super excited. to. I'm, I'm in a great place. I'm excited to be me. And I'd like bringing that excitement. I want everybody to be excited to be themselves. So I know that might sound kind of corny, but hey, I'm, I'm about uplifting. And I want everybody to be uplifted, you know, <laughs> and yeah. we do it through music. We do it through metal. We do it through, you know, just kick ass and just the the excitement you get from hearing great music great metal i want to be a part of that totally awesome so thank you for your time man thank you milos i appreciate it thank you very much and and best of luck to you and and we'll be in touch soon no doubt yeah yeah awesome so have a nice day all right you too brother thank you very much we'll see you soon bye 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 Hey people, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Agoraphobic News. Please like, share and subscribe to our YouTube channel to help us grow. You can also support us on Patreon by becoming one of our patrons. And big shout out to our patron Season of Mist for supporting our work. So stay tuned for another interview and keep it metal.